welcome back to another Nature's Always Right episode. Today I'm doing a farm tour with Jeff Bednar of Profound Micro Farms and Profound Foods, a new food hub here in Dallas, Texas. So we're going to get to ask him a lot of really cool questions. We're going to get to see this amazing greenhouse and hydroponic setup. So let's go check it out. So this greenhouse is a three hoop gutter connect. It's about 8,000 square feet. We've got four main systems. There, uh, There's three big deep water culture ponds. Uh, this one is uh, 32 by 34, I believe. Uh -huh. And uh, we kind of had to work, we had an existing greenhouse when we bought the property, so we kind of had to work to fit it in, in here. Mm -hmm. um, they're about 18 inches deep, full of uh, hydroponic water and then rafts mm -hmm. floating on top. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And let's see, you got some, a uh, few different types of lettuce here. What are you, what types are these? Uh, so this is a Breen Romaine, it's a red romaine. Um, and we're, we'll harvest it kind of at an adolescent size. And then mm -hmm. we've also got a Dragoon Romaine over here. Oh, yeah. I've tried, um, I've tried those. Dragoon's a great one, and it yeah. holds up summer heat in Texas is one of our, our biggest problems, and we can usually grow that all the way through the summer in here. Nice. So, okay. Uh, one of the things we found is with a big body of water, it helps regulate the temperature a lot to make it a little bit easier to go mm. through the summer. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I know a lot, of, a lot of field farmers, to keep the lettuce a little bit less bitter and, and from bolting, they'll, like, miss the lettuce. Um, you know, throughout the day. Do you, do you have to do anything like that? We, we don't really do that. One yeah. of the things we will do is we'll harvest a lot smaller size heads of lettuce. Mm, so okay. um, we sell lots of chefs and so what we'll do is we actually have a case size instead mm -hmm. of a count. Uh -huh. So in the summertime they'll just get more in the case. In mm -hmm. the wintertime they'll get less in the case but they'll be bigger. Is it like by weight? Is that uh, or, it's or by nice. case size. Like case so we just that way the chef will know they're getting that amount of lettuce no matter how many heads are in the box. Right. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the weight's a hard one because we're doing living root products. So the more heads that are in there, the more the box weighs, but there's not necessarily more lettuce in it. So, oh, so in the box itself, if you're wrapping the root in there and yeah, we, them all Yeah, together. we harvest, wrap the roots, and then kind of go from there. That's really cool. Does, yeah. um, do any chefs use the roots at all? Has, not, not that I know of. No. Yeah. Okay. That'd be kind of fun, though. Yeah, it would. It would, it would. Yeah. Um, what else do you got going on here? What, what is this plant? So this one's a red vein sorrel. It's uh, one of our chef's favorites. It's actually like our, our third best seller that we have. Uh -huh. um, it's super, uh, it's got a fresh citrusy flavor, mm -hmm. a little bit of tang to it. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it looks amazing on a plate with yeah. the kind of the red veins on it. And stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a fun one, yeah. So let's, um, what else you got going over here? We got... Um, yeah, so this is a Toscano kale. There's premier kale. We grow six different kinds of kale. We're typically six. harvesting petite kales. Mm -hmm. We found that it's a, we, we, we do a little bit better financially by selling mm -hmm. petite kales, which are harder for chefs to get. Mm. Um, so Toscano, Curly, Scarlet, uh -huh. Premier. Uh, and then we're behind that is some baby chards. We saw a lot of uh, baby Swiss chard. Yeah. Uh, super tender. It's got a great flavor and doesn't really require cooking. Yes. Um, and then sure. there's some more of the romaines and then there's some different oak leaf lettuces over here, mm -hmm. sweet crisp, and then that's one of our kale mixes. Yeah, essentially what we're going to do is when we harvest, we're just going to come on, pull this guy out, and then a lot of times uh, we have a couple different ways we'll sell it, but one is with yeah. the living roots and we'll just wrap the roots on and then bag yeah. this, and then the other way is we'll cut it off nice. and bring that to market. It's yeah. really beautiful. So each is each cell a different variety? Or is in one uh, no, cell, there's, there's multiple varieties. Multiple varieties in each cell. So okay. we seed it pretty heavy. I think there's probably eight to 10 seeds per cell. Nice. Wow. So yeah, and this is a little bit bigger than we would normally sell it. It's uh -huh. probably, once again, the next size down is what, what goes. We try to grow a little bit more than we need each week. Mm -hmm. And it's better to have some to donate or give away than to mm -hmm. sell out for our chefs. They need that consistency. So we try and get a little bit more than we need. So yeah, if you didn't have something and the chef needs it, they might be like, I don't know, There's if, I a wanna, problem. I don't know if I want to work with you. Like, you right. gotta have it. So at, um, I think 17 or 18 of our restaurants, our name is on the menu. And so we do not want them replacing yeah. that with stuff from California or Mexico. Absolutely. And then having our friends go there ordering a profound salad and then not getting it's our not stuff. Profound. Yeah, so exactly. That's okay. So that's a really important factor. Yeah, so then yeah. it's better for us to, you know, do a, a lunch and give it to the employees or friends or family and have just this little bit of extra big stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. so these restaurants, it seems like it's the consistency is, is crazy important. Yeah, that's we work, work really hard to build a brand of consistency and quality mm -hmm. in that order. So mm -hmm. like we're beginning growers, we're still figuring this out, mm -hmm. but having the having it there every single Tuesday mm -hmm. and every single Thursday is the number one thing for our chefs. They need to have it. It's We're on the menu, they're serving it, it's gotta be there. And then I see, it looks like you have the different successions starting in the back, the babies, and then you know as we come forward, yeah, so right now we're on, we're on about a five-week uh, rotation of lettuce in the winter time. So uh -huh. you can see that this is the harvest here. The week before that, week before, week before, week before. 
Right. Um, so every we seed every Monday. This week you're going to harvest all this. Then you're shifting all the wraps forward? Yes, yeah, so it's essentially this works like a big conveyor belt. Yeah, so okay. each week we harvest from the center here. We'll pull this raft out. We'll pull it up to a nice working height. Uh -huh. We'll harvest clean off 100% of the bad leaves. Uh -huh. So we're delivering 100% usable product other than the roots. Right. And then we'll go to the end and just basically push the whole pond this way uh -huh. and put the new seedlings in. So okay. it, it works pretty, uh, it's a pretty good system. That is really cool. Yeah. Really cool. So yeah, harvest, put in the new rock wool, or with the new seedlings, I should say. Yep, new seedlings. Boom, they go to the back corner, and the cycle starts again. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So every Tuesday and Thursday morning, we harvest, and then we deliver same day. Mm -hmm. So they're getting the freshest product. So what it, it seems like one of the really big benefits of hydro is you're able to produce a consistent product kind of without almost fail. Um, you know There's that you're going to, well, well. <laughs> Yeah, this is still farming. Yeah, you yeah, know. they're still farming. Yeah, because you can control so many variables. Yeah, I'm comparing it to what you know I'm doing in you know field growing. Uh, yeah, it's hard it's to compare. It's a little to more that, variable. Yeah. I can't like completely guarantee that this Tuesday, this Thursday is going to be you know so, the same size every time. So I'm not a. I think that there's definitely hydroponic growers and greenhouse growers that can yeah. do that. Yeah. We're not there yet. We've only had this greenhouse in production since for about 20 months. Okay. Wow. So we haven't even gotten a full two years yet to mm. know exactly what our cycles are. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we were really careful about doing is packaging things and telling our chefs so we can set expectations. So mm -hmm. kind of like the case size, yeah. you know, like if I could grow the exact same size of lettuce every single week throughout the year, then I would sell it by the head versus See. selling it by the case. And mm. sometimes there's 24, sometimes there's 30, but the chefs know what size, you know, how much they're getting, gotcha. which gives us leeway to kind of work with our, how yeah. we grow and the that sort of thing. a little smaller, a little bigger, then you just... They're still getting the same amount and they're right. they're pretty fine they just don't want gigantic right. heads of lettuce chefs don't use you know uh, huge heads they want usually petite the smaller tinder, the better better tasting better texture. smaller leaves so they're not chopped leaves on a plate they're whole leaves right. that look you know beautiful so jeff um i'm really curious how you're you know controlling temperature and the humidity i just have no idea how that works in a greenhouse like this could you tell yeah. us more about it so north texas is one of the, the from what I understand, it's one of the more difficult places to actually grow. So inside mm -hmm. of the greenhouse, mm -hmm. we control temperature with a few different ways. In the summertime, it's biggest it's com uh, combating the heat. So uh -huh. we have an evaporative cooler behind us. It's also called a, a swamp cooler. Mm -hmm. And essentially what happens is, is there's pumps, there's a sump, pump water gets pumped up to the top. Uh -huh. It drips through. This is like a cardboardy structure. Uh -huh. And so when the f big fans on the other side kick on, they'll actually pull the air through here. And oh. because of the evaporative process, it cools the air as it goes through. It's not nearly as effective on super humid days, uh -huh. but it works really, really well. We could drop the temperature 10 to 15 degrees with this wall. Wow. So there's so water would drip over these Yeah, essentially things? it just sprays and goes, this entire wall will be wet. Wow. And so then the air passes through it, and as air passes over water, it evaporates and then cools the air. Right. So it's a giant swamp cooler. It's a giant swamp cooler is exactly what it is, yeah. yeah. Wow. And then we also have a lot of circulation fans. And you see we've got uh -huh. a lot of these big fans. We don't really need them in the uh, the wintertime, but it helps with circulation okay. and keeping the leaves dry, which is where you'll have a lot of problems with diseases and that sort of thing uh, with wet leaves. Interesting. So that's yeah. one of the reasons right. we don't overwater anything. It's all mm -hmm. underwatering. Because in the field, it's a lot, you know, there's sunlight and there's always wind moving, so it's not yeah. much of a problem. So you're kind of simulating. Sim yeah, simulating and, and controlling. And it. controlling so, at the same yeah, time. Yeah, so the circulation fans are helping move the air uh -huh. around in here, but it's also kind of agitating the plants to make them a little stronger. You know, it gets very cold here, as I've, I've, as I've learned. Yeah, it's 25 degrees last night. Yeah. Morning, so. so then how do you heat? So right now we're heating through, uh, heating the air with big propane heaters, which propane. is not a super efficient way to work, uh, mm -hmm. to heat it, but mm -hmm. it actually it works and it's pretty easy and it was on our existing greenhouse. Mm -hmm. In the future, we're going to be installing water heaters. Water. Heating water is going to be a lot uh, uh. more economical than heating the air. And is that because it, it holds the temperature more efficiently? Exactly. Or? So we, we actually have 30,000 gallons of water in the greenhouse. And okay. because they're big, deep bodies of water, if you yeah. heat that water up, it'll hold the heat. Yeah. Plus, it's insulated on the bottom. And the rafts uh, are a big floating piece of styrofoam insulation. insulation. <laughs> so it's going to be way more economical. And, and, uh, and the plant leaves with the leafy greens that we're growing uh -huh. are actually mostly fine. They can get really, really cold, as you know. So if we can just keep the root balls at 65 mm -hmm. degrees, which would be really easy, the air temperature isn't going to matter on them. Oh. Wow, so it'll be a lot more economical to do, and so we just haven't got to that project yet. But what, what, uh, how do you heat the water? What does that look like? Pool heaters. Pool heaters. So we're gonna get a propane pool heaters and install them and just circulate the water in there. So in, in San Diego, when I grow in summer, I use low tunnels to okay. protect all of my greens, and I use 50/50 shade to yeah. do that, and it works really well. So in, in your greenhouse, do you do something similar? Or yeah, so this is 60% shade cloth. We 60. use the solar reflective shade cloth. Uh, we've had really good results is with that. Is that the, like the, the Illuminate stuff? Uh, this one is a the Svensson thing? brand. So okay. it's a little bit different than the Illuminate. There's not as much metal in it, I think. Okay. 
Uh, but it is a reflective, so it's black mm. on the top and white on the bottom. Okay. Done it the other way around. Nice. But um, yeah, we'll stretch that out, and basically we just leave it out mm -hmm. all summer long, and then we'll put it back up in the winter and move it back and forth so you can see all the wires along the top. Oh, like I see it. Yep. Well, it looks like it's pretty easy to move around and take, you know, move back and forth. I'm sure it's it, a little bit of work. Yeah, it's about a four-hour project twice yeah. a year, so it's not it's not, not too hard. Yeah. It's not bad. So I'm, nice. Uh, another investment I've thought about is the retractable shade cloth, but that's. It's, uh, yeah. it's pretty expensive. So. Yeah. And it's only four hours of labor. Exactly. Time, so it's not yeah. that much money. So. Nice. I like that. So you're running, like, how many months do you have to run it? Uh, so we'll put up shade cloth in mid May and we'll have it up till essentially the end of September. It's still pretty warm it in could. September, but the light kind of changes a little bit. So okay. it's not the as intensity. hot. Yeah. September's still really hot here, but uh, October's yeah. a little bit more mild. And the plastic is just always on the, the house. The plastic is always on. It's a double yeah. insulated, uh, inflated mm -hmm. poly. Mm. So one of the ways that we grow is uh, using the NFT nutrient film technique. So basically these are gutters. This is um, a dianthus flower and some stock flowers and oxalis. And so we found we've done a lot of experiments with plants to find which ones like the best systems. And so some of these like dianthus that grow a little bit taller, mm -hmm. are they do a lot better in this system than they'll do in a deep water culture. And they're also a lot easier to harvest because we're right here right pulling there. the flowers and we harvest a lot of the, the little flowers and the greens off of them. What? What makes a plant more suitable for the NFT? Like, why, why are they responding more healthily versus like lettuce? Or... So, I, you know, lettuce does fine in the NFTs as well, but we found we've got a lot better result the deep water culture. Does the roots go a bit longer? and So the roots can get a little bit bigger. We have kind of deeper NFT channels than I think a lot of people have, and they're capped uh -huh. on the end so they can hold a little bit of water versus mm -hmm. just being just the... the uh, uh, the film of water across the bottom. Mm. Uh, but one of the things that we found is that things that are cut and come again, they're gonna be here a little bit longer with our style of NFTs. Okay. It's been a lot more efficient. So um, cut and come again is, is good for Yeah, NFTs. so we're not we're not doing any one-time harvest in our Got NFTs it. right now. Okay. Yeah, so it's, okay. some of the longer term, smaller things like Oxalis and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. will do really well in the NFT towers. Mm. So, and then Very one cool. of the other things we found is we go a lot of celery. Mm -hmm. And so celery in the NFT will end up getting a really big kind of root mass mm -hmm. um, and stock to it. And inside of the, the uh, rafts, it'll break the rafts because it'll actually push the styrofoam oh. apart. And so it ruins the rafts to cook it in, to, to grow it in there versus yeah. in the hard plastic where it doesn't, doesn't really hurt it. Eventually, they'll grow and get strangled out. Right. But wow. we'll replace them with, with the successional planting before then. Interesting. Cool. So, yeah, yeah, there's just, you know, as with the field farming, there's a context for all these different systems. And there's an ideal situation for each kind of species of plants. And... I'm sure it's a lot of trial and error to, to figure those yeah, things out. Yeah, we, we killed a lot of plants. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So these guys, uh, we, we're using Rockle for a lot of our starts. It's a, a great medium. Um, once it's pH balanced, it's pretty easy to use. Oh, uh -huh. So we'll basically start our seeds inside of a, a, a warm room. We'll let them germinate for a couple of days, uh -huh. and then we'll bring them out. So you can see these guys just got brought out and put in the sun today. They're barely getting started. And then uh, after uh, in the wintertime, about th two and a half, three weeks. In the summertime, about two weeks, we'll bring them, and then we'll break the little cubes apart and put them into the System. Mm -hmm. So they come in as like a brick when you buy them, I guess. It's, yeah, it's a flat. For a 1020. Yeah, it's a flat that fits in a 1020. Oh, they're oh all, yeah. It yeah, they're like already... A, uh, it's like plug trays. Yes, yeah, they're already cubes ready to yeah. be plugged into the system. Ah, very cool. It's a really nice medium to work with. It's like easy it? to plant in. We get a really yeah. high germination rate. Um, nice. The ease of use of having employees take a square plug and put it into a square hole is, it, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a very simple process. Yeah, absolutely. Good, yeah, so, it's easy to train people for that. And, yeah. Uh, what is it made out of? Uh, so Rockwell, uh, my understanding is, is essentially they've, they've taken some sort of rock substance, heated it up like lava, yeah. and then form it out. It's, it's so, almost like a hard cotton candy. Yeah, okay. That'd be another way to kind it's, of describe uh, it. I think perlite and vermiculite are made the same way. They say it's like a rock they heat up and it expands into these little popcorn. And then popcorn. They, yeah, break, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so it's like the same type, type of material. Yeah, it's very similar. So this is our uh, microgreen, microgreen production area. Uh, we're, we do, I think, about 40 or 50 different kinds of microgreens each week for chefs. We'll do some in living trays. Uh, so we use the, the bootstrap farmer trays and we'll bring this actually out to chefs. Mm. Um, we've let some of them go to different sizes. This is more of the true leaf size of the mustard. Uh -huh. um, and then some of them, when we'll cut them, we'll go through and kind of trim them off and put them into clamshells and that uh -huh. sort of thing. Mostly what we're using for a substrate is more of the rock wool. We'll buy the, the crest plates is what they're called, but essentially mm -hmm. it's a rock wool slab mm -hmm. seed directly on top of that. And then we have other varieties such like the, the peas and the uh, sunflower shoots and uh -huh. that sort of thing. They do a lot better in soil. Uh, we'll typically oh, use like okay. a pro mix for that sort of thing. Because it's got like a bigger uh, seed and that's yeah. why. Yeah. They, 
it's not as happy on the rock wall. It's, it's kind of interesting, been experimenting, figuring out. We'll we'll test multiple different kinds of medium for each mm -hmm. seed that we'll do until we find what you know where it does the best. Mm. And you mentioned you deliver the chef the tray. Yeah. Why the tray some, sometimes and versus the clamshell? Chef so preference or it's a chef preference. So some chefs will actually they'll take this tray yeah. and they'll display it out. Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah, and they'll that's set cool. it on their their production line and then uh -huh. they'll trim as they go. The catch is, is that they've got a day or two before it needs to be watered, okay. and chefs are really, really busy. So sometimes they can't always get back to watering. Um, it's not for everybody. We have it's, some chefs yeah. that'll actually take the living tray and put it right in the walk-in, and they can keep it in the oh. walk-in for five or six days. So oh. it depends on how quick they're That's going cool through trick. it. And then we also have some chefs that'll buy 15 different varieties a week. And wow. when they're buying that many, they can't get 15 trays a week. They just don't have the way to, to keep that. So we'll cut those, put them into clams. They'll keep them in the walk-in. Okay, that's a good combination right there. Exactly. So, so that's cool. Um, and then are you, is this like a flood and drain system for water? Yeah. Or is it top watered? Or? Uh, so this is a flood and drain system. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if there's a system that relies on my memory to water something, it's not yeah. going to live very long. So uh, <laughs> there's a sump down at the bottom over here. And basically, we're just using straight water in them. Microgreens, aren't, they don't need a ton of nutrients. Yeah. Yep. So um, we'll just uh, once a day in the wintertime, twice a day in the summertime, it'll flood. The important thing is not to get it over the level of the seeds because the crest okay. plates are about a half inch thick. Uh -huh. You just need a very thin film of water to get them rehydrated. And then for harvesting, is it just a knife? Do you? I've seen some people, they use like a, like a barber clipper looking thing. Or so we've got a couple it? different ways we'll do it. Uh, right now we found scissors is about the most effective way to do a sh yeah. sharp pair of scissors, but we also yeah. have one of those little grass clipping things yeah, yes. that works really good for pea shoots and that sort of yeah. thing nice. um, so that speeds it up mm -hmm. but uh yeah there's we're still experimenting experimenting learning i've heard that the knife method works the electric knife works really oh, well too right. very cool yeah i mean that's you know always dialing in the technique and that's the farmer's life so. yeah, exactly yeah, so these are our vertical towers or zip go towers you can uh -huh. see them kind of got a lot of nasturtiums around uh-huh um there's a lot of advantages, few disadvantages to growing in towers. We were able to buy these secondhand. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, one of the things that we love to grow in them are the nasturtiums. We're able to harvest the flowers pretty easily and get to them. Uh -huh. um, they're, they're pretty easy to maintain. We can actually just take the whole tower out when it comes time to harvest and set it on a table. So everything's at harvest uh, size. Oh, yeah, I like Essentially, that. Essentially, what's happening here is there's just water flowing all the time, okay. dripping through the little um, okay. Uh, emitters here and uh -huh. we can control the rate of watering so some plants are going to like more water less water right yeah that's neat. pretty straightforward then the water goes through there to a gutter and then back to a sump in the corner cool. yeah i like that you have the ability to take these off put them horizontally and then do your harvest and yeah. you're saving your back exactly uh, it's more efficient faster I, I broke my back five or six years ago and oh wow so that it, it, looking at how do we spend less time bent over has been uh, Huge. been a big part of farming for me. All right, thanks again, Jeff, for that wonderful tour. Um, yeah. I learned so much about hydro. It was really interesting, and um, I'd love to see uh, what you're doing here. And uh, stay tuned for the next video because uh, I'm going to sit down with Jeff, and we're going to talk to him all about Found Foods, which is the food hub that he set up, which is working with over 50 different uh, farmers and chefs and